I'm Bill Simpich. I'm uh, an activist with the Vandenberg Action Coalition. It's a network of groups that was active in the early 80s and it's been revived over the last 12 months. And the focus of the Vandenberg Action Coalition is to bring people together to take action against the activities at the base, specifically the Star Wars program and the counterinsurgency programs as well. What you're seeing is the same technique as is used in development of first strike weaponry, uh, precision. Uh, to obtain precision, what they are doing is they're launching missiles 4,000 miles on a regular basis from Vandenberg Air Force Base to Kwajalein uh, Island, uh, which is part of the Marshalls. And uh, what you're seeing there is whether it's an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon, they're trying to see if they can land it in their tiny little lagoon. And they've got radar tracking and all these other devices to see just how accurate it is. The only difference is with the Star Wars technology, they're trying to shoot it down. And you see a lot in the press about whether or not the tests have been faked. Generally, they're faked. But uh, the last thing we want is for these uh, tests to ever become accurate, because the last thing we want to see is an effective defensive uh, system, because that would mean in the real world uh, that the offensive system, which is also tested between Vandenberg and Kwajalein, would be even more of a disruptive influence in world affairs than it is now. Vandenberg Air Force Base is a very, very important piece of the puzzle in breaking down the system of dominance. Vandenberg Air Force Base is an ideal place for missile testing for several reasons. The first two that pop to mind are number one, uh, because it has uh, a treaty, if you will, with the people in the Marshall Islands uh, to use the Kwajalein uh, Lagoon as a testing range. And what this is is a, is a series of small islands with a lagoon in the middle, and they can set up their radar uh, systems and the rest and track very accurately the precision of the missile as well as launch another missile to try to shoot down that missile on the defensive side. On the offensive side, it's identical, except they don't try to shoot it down. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, secondly, uh, Vandenberg's important because it faces the south, unlike uh, the ocean is to the south. So you can launch the missile over to, from the south and go into polar orbit, going south to north, rather than uh, Cape Canaveral, where you can't do that. There's too much land, uh, populated land to the south. They can't launch it from there. And that's important because you do have accidents. You can't have it falling on civilians. And when you go into polar orbit, then you're in, able to in, engage in surveillance uh, and mapping and other uh, capabilities that are critical, not only for first strike, but for counterinsurgency warfare and surveillance in general. So it's quite scary. Uh, to see a, a site with that many abilities, and Vandenberg fits it to a T. Vandenberg is destined to be the major spaceport of the 21st century, and we want to see it turn to civilian purposes, not to military. We're able to uh, literally expand our sense of what's possible with nonviolent direct action. Most of the time, you're able to shut down a building uh, for, you know, at best a day, like at the WTO, and that was pretty historic. Most of the time we're talking minutes or seconds in terms of an effective disruption. If you're trying to stop something that you do not like. And the fascinating thing about campaigns at places like Vandenberg is that you're able to stop these launches for days, we think even weeks at a time, uh, with the proper mobilization. We feel that we were successful in uh, in stopping these launches for days at a time in uh, the 80s at places like Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg. And uh, we feel that if we could get critical mass of tens of thousands of people to literally, you know, uh, moms and teachers and you name it, to walk on this base and say, not in our name, we could literally bring the system to a grinding halt. The reason to focus these actions at Vandenberg Air Force Base is because of three reasons I would offer. One is that the permeability of the base. It's very easy to hike into the base. 
it's relatively uh, easy, although a little bit strenuous, to get to the actual place where they are trying to launch these missiles and put your body on the line to literally stop the missile from going off. Uh, there's various tactics from, from uh, sound horns to uh, visual displays that can announce one's presence and literally make it impossible for them to clear the security zone, which is necessary in order to launch a missile. The second is that all good movements need a focus, and you need a dramatic focus, a dramatic backdrop, and Vandenberg offers all those things. And three, the educational uh, impact of, of learning about what's going on at that base is unbelievable. The, the billions and billions of dollars that go into this uh, arms race and counterinsurgency style campaigns is incredible. One uh, piece of the puzzle here is just the sheer amount of money that's being expended into these satellites that engage in a variety of uh, roles such as surveillance, targeting, and the rest. For example, the KH-12 satellite is a surveillance satellite that snaps pictures around the globe. There's an array of these satellites. Just one of these satellites costs more than $2 billion. That's money that's being stolen from the people of our country, and we've got to take it back. I think there's a special uh, power when you're able to get in the way of testing. And this is one of the most visible forms of testing there is. And it's also highly environmentally dangerous, and uh, we're talking about sacred Indian land here to the Chumash people in particular. It's got the ability to bring in lots of different constituencies regardless of uh, where they may stand on other issues. Another aspect that has to be looked at when you're looking at uh, missile testing is just the incredible environmental impact uh, that ensues. The space shuttle uh, uh, is one of the workhorses of the, of the space fleet, if you will. They're not using it at Vandenberg right now, but it's, they all came very, very close to doing it. And we put up a de determined fight to stop it, which we think played a role in them not bringing it to, to uh, California. It was simply too visible a uh, uh, symbol of opposition. Each one of those flights takes away about one ten thousandth of the ozone layer, literally strips it away. Uh, this is pretty well documented at this point, and yet we keep chipping away at it. Similarly, they, they dump tons and tons of hydrochloric acid mixed with water all over the Earth uh, at, you know, in the process of a launch. These other missiles spit out similar uh, toxins, and they create enormous uh, liquid and solid toxins that get disposed of God knows how because the military has virtually no effective controls put on it by DOE or any other regulatory agency. You go to places like Port Chicago and it's just toxed out. This is the way it is around military bases around the country. It's one of the biggest blind spots, frankly, with, among the environmental movement, to, that they're not focusing squarely on these sites. And uh, I would urge people to make that a, a central point in any campaign either at Vandenberg or anywhere else. The whole SDI, or now they call it the NMD program, is the idea to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, to start and win a nuclear war in the name of putting an umbrella over the United States. Uh, one, you know, the whole idea of the umbrella over the United States and whether or not it leaks is looking at the question backwards. The real question is whether it makes a nuclear war even thinkable, or a nuclear strike on one of the rogue states like North Korea, thinkable. And, and that is precisely what it does. There is no effective way to pr protect uh, any country, nor would we want to. Uh, uh, the whole idea is to make nuclear war or anything like it unthinkable. And to that end, the only way to make it unthinkable is to ensure that no defensive uh, systems are ever deployed because all they'll do is make the unthinkable thinkable. On October 7th of 2000, we went to the base to conduct an action. It was part of an international day of actions around the world to uh, stop 
uh, missile defense. And it was kind of fascinating because we had uh, uh, hundreds of people there and uh, 23 of us wound up getting arrested. They had scores of these poor airmen literally frog stepping in formation back and forth, trying to intimidate us from crossing the line. And uh, we, people went across in ones and twos and threes singing and, and holding signs or puppets and offering their vision. And uh, that happened after a very powerful uh, uh, line of a large number of us, all holding hands and singing, right at the line uh, occurred. They were really pretty unglued. They had a helicopter in the air trying to drown out our speeches. They had uh, German shepherds in attack mode. They had a water cannon poised to go off, which they almost used, all in the face of 23 arrests. The funny thing we're finding with the arrest right now is they don't want to press the charges. The reason they don't want to press the charges is they don't want the publicity. They cannot stand the idea of the spotlight uh, uh, being focused on them uh, through court activities, that kind of thing. Usually they don't care. Uh, they're bending way over backwards to make this uh, series of events go away. They're hoping it'll just die down from its own weight. What I always point out to people uh, who question why a not guilty plea makes sense in a nonviolent direct action context is to look to Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King pled, guilty, pled not guilty all the time. Uh, DAs like to forget this fact when they're uh, saying, why aren't you accepting the consequence of your actions? I think the focus is nonviolent civil resistance, for one thing. And also, I think it's important to realize that we are the, we are the folks who are engaged in preventing the crimes here. Uh, we are, in a sense, the prosecutors, and uh, the government is in the role of the defendants. We are the people who are stopping the reckless endangerment, which is a crime in most states, uh, and should be around the world for the, these type of activities. These activities constitute a nuisance, they constitute crimes, they constitute uh, the gravest possible dangers to humanity. And whether you're looking at the local law or the state law or the federal law, I think imaginative people can point to examples in each realm about why we're, we're the crime stoppers and these people are in fact acting as criminals or, or accomplices. The problem with international law uh, is that it's taken a long time to be uh, applied to our system of government. We're seeing some uh, steps forward regarding torture and other uh, issues like that in the civil arena, but in the criminal arena, you cannot really get an international law defense in most instances. I recommend to people that you use a neutrality act, which is part of the domestic law, which states that you can't utilize uh, uh, weapons of aggression. And uh, I, anybody who looks at uh, missile defense for more than 10 seconds will realize that it's really a weapon of aggression. It's tied in with the offensive weapons in a very duplicitous way. And I really feel that if people use the Neutrality Act and are serious about it, you'll get judges to utilize it and you'll get juries to acquit. I think uh, any convictions in a direct action campaign uh, uh, should they occur, uh, should not be a deterrent to either the person convicted or to the larger community. It's, uh, it's important to not accept probation whenever possible uh, because you don't want to create even the precedent for that kind of deterrence by the prosecution. So I would urge people to accept whatever punishment the state hands down at the end of the line rather than take probation. Uh, it's our fear of the government that remains the reason why these activities are going on today. When enough people uh, stand up and fill the jails or fill the community service programs or what have you, uh, they recognize that probation is not an effective deterrent, that punishment is not an effective deterrent, and start turning to new policies like, for example, refusing to arrest, refusing to prosecute, all of which we've seen in nonviolent direct action campaigns of the past. Backcountry actions are very powerful for uh, those of us who want to try to get to the security zones where they are testing, 
the missiles and uh, themselves, uh, launching the missiles, if you will. And uh, for that, for those reasons alone, I think backcountry action is really crucial. I think it's also inspirational for the people involved to really be able to put their body on the line in a direct way that is generally impossible in a lot of contexts, especially in urban settings. And uh, there's also an educational aspect. Every time somebody goes backcountry, we learn more about the base, we learn more about their security system, we learn more about the individuals and make allies within the security system. So for all those reasons, backcountry actions play a, a key role. One question that often comes up is, how is this movement going to grow? How are more people going to participate in this? And uh, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a tough question. You look at the Vietnam era, uh, people became active in the Vietnam struggle because they felt personally threatened. Similar with the anti-nuclear issue. People had to feel personally threatened before they stepped up. And uh, so there's no magic uh, bullet uh, to the question of what, what will it take to uh, motivate uh, more of us to uh, step forward. At some point, I think uh, we might be able to bring, uh, see other constituencies step forward in the fight, whether they're in the fight in their communities, in urban areas, or labor, at the workplace, uh, all saying that missile defense represents a tremendous theft of our resources and, is, and also, and this is crucial, is morally repugnant to our values as human beings. A lot of people ask about the role of the media because the media is a, a unblinking monster in a certain respect. It can uh, take the most trivial aspects, you know, like who's got the biggest hair, who's got the wildest costume, and misportray the movement uh, in some kind of fringe way. Or they can focus on the most pedestrian aspect of it, such as Star Wars costs too much or Star Wars. Uh, won't work. That's the one you hear most frequently, which is really enraging. Uh, the, the economic issue is important, but the, 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 the umbrella, the leaky umbrella issue is really counterproductive. And, but there's only one answer, I think, to the issue of the media is we have to go out there and do good media. We have to go out there and educate. We have to go out there and have effective spokespeople uh, and at the same time train all of our all of the activists involved in a campaign to be effective spokesperson when the camera gets pushed in one's face. Uh, to that end, we, uh, much like the, uh, uh, the globalization struggle, uh, have an important role of playing in uh, pushing the discussion forward. We know the media is not going to give us everything we want, but, but if we uh, factor in the role the media plays, we can use it effectively, but we just can't have unrealistic expectations about either ignoring it or advancing it. People ask about the objections to uh, NMD on technical grounds, uh, and I resist the question uh, because I don't like uh, the idea of NMD working. Uh, I, th there, there's a lot of people who can tell you uh, a lot of reasons why it won't work, and I would agree with them. Uh, but I can't make that the focus for, for my analysis. The worst nightmare would be if they could ever get all the pieces to work. Because if they got the pieces to work for NMD, we would have, in fact, a shield around the United States, and we would become a garrison state we would be able to turn to other powers in the world and say, we will do exactly as we damn well please, and you will take it, and you will like it, and we would proceed to uh, uh, envelop even more of the resources of the world than we already do. At, at this point, we suck up the majority of the resources for 6% of the population. Uh, it's unsustainable, it can't go on. The idea of NMD working <laughs> is the greatest nightmare. And I think that the people on the, in the arms control community should be ashamed of themselves for making the arguments they do about uh, why it won't work on technical grounds. I think they've got it entirely backwards. One of the things that is just enraging about the entire military budget 
uh, is the uh, degree of, of theft that it represents from the poor, from the taxpayers, and from other people around the world who, uh, who could stand to benefit by a better uh, allocation of our resources. When you think about military weapons, what you're doing is you're investing hundreds of billions of dollars of things that are designed God willing to stay in the ground <laughs> and be inert and never be used. What greater theft is there than that? <laughs> there, I can't think of one. I think the most compelling argument about national missile defense is that it's, uh, it's a Frankenstein monster. Once you create uh, uh, a system that's trying to implant a national missile defense. You've created a, a, a system of fear because uh, other countries are afraid now that we'll become more aggressive. Uh, and people in this country are feeling that they don't have enough protection because this protection is illusory. There will never be enough. I don't think that uh, it's possible on a technical uh, basis to have full national missile defense, which delights me. And I, I can't think of a greater nightmare than if it were to happen. But what happens as a result of this discussion, and we had it all through the 1950s, this is nothing new you know, uh, about anti-missile missiles, is uh, it, you wind up in this treadmill of paranoia. And uh, there's nothing worse than the Cold War mentality, where any outrage is justifiable in the name of smashing your enemy. I don't want to go back to that era again. The interesting thing for me around uh, national missile defense and the militarization of space is that the, the, ter the terrific thing if, about NMD, if there is anything that's terrific about it, is that it makes the militarization of space so visible. Uh, and this is kind of a passion of mine because it's been going on since the beginning of the space program. It's largely a military program. The civilian program, which I like, in, in some respects, the exploration side at least, uh, is basically a fig leaf. It's the public relations aspect. It's the cover for the military program. And uh, so to see that unveiled uh, to even some extent in the eyes of the public is a very powerful thing. Uh, the connections are vast. When you look at what these uh, these satellites do, the 80, 90 percent of all the satellites we put up, what are they for? Well, some of them are for surveillance and you know, the spy techniques. Uh, and they, those things can read a license plate. That's not the kind of world I like living in, where they can literally track political activists with satellites. But even scarier than that uh, is the role of the other satellites. Like you think about the weather satellites. Well, are they out there? Uh, checking the cloud patterns for scientific purposes? No. What they're doing is they're making sure that the missiles can land more accurately on somebody's backyard. Uh, same goes for the navigational satellites. Again, that's to navigate the missiles. Uh, that's not designed to save sailors. That may be the outcome of the Navstar system, which is replacing uh, the older system of Loran. But what it's really for is being able to uh, make mobile missiles, for example, just as precise as ground-based missiles. Mobile missiles are much more dangerous because you can hide them in a mountain, bring them back out, shoot your target, hide back in the mountain again. What's it for? First strike. That's why people are scared about it. And this discussion goes on. You, you, they study the gravitational pull of the Earth in a system called geodesy. What is that for? That's for mapping the gravitational pull just so, so you'll be able to get the missile to its target more accurately. Uh, it, it, whether you, you focus on you know, the, the surveillance aspect or the navigational aspect or the meteorological aspect or the gravitational aspect or uh, any one of a number of these aspects of these satellites, they keep coming back to the same thing, to make it easier to hit your target, just like those old computers they designed back in the 1940s. It's a terrifying system. It's a never-ending system for dominance. And we've got to find effective ways to expose this system. And this is one of them. It's quite obvious to me that 
if what we need in this country is we need a, a campaign based on truth and reconciliation like they had in South Africa after the fall of apartheid. And if we're going to have true truth and reconciliation in this country, we've got to utilize the powers of nonviolent direct action to their outmost limits. And if there's ever, ever a tool for bringing down Star Wars, uh, thousands of people hiking in to the military bases and withdrawing their consent has got to be it. One of the big aspects that people miss about the role of the military in general is uh, they focus on the hardware like the missiles and the satellites. And they forget the, uh, they forget, uh, the role of counterinsurgency. In other words, it provides the United States with a very staggering degree of omnipotence in terms of world affairs and uh, the ability to crush democratic resistance in other countries simply because that democratic resistance might interfere with the plans of Gulf or Mobile or whatever corporation has certain interests. So to that end, uh, people think of the satellites as guiding missiles. I'm saying, well, that's important and I want to get that piece out there, but I also want to get the other piece out there, which is the role in day-to-day -day combat in small nations in Africa and South America where democratically led movements are routinely getting crushed by uh, dictatorships.